Oh. <laughs> Austin, Austin, Austin. Whoa, Austin. Whoa, whoa, what, 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 what? <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt your fun. Oh, yes, yes, You've yes. You've been watching your cats way too much. Yeah, I know, I have been. <laughs> um, so I brought you out here to show you a new thing. Oh, really, what? It's by Pro Flight Trainer. Okay, hold on, Pro Flight Trainer, okay. So you've got a flight instructor that's also your personal trainer. He also does workout and health and stuff like that with you, not helps that you with I know your diet. Of, but it's called oh. the Puma X or 10. I'm not sure which. Puma. So it's a shoe. You want to show me a tennis shoe, a Puma. For doing workouts with your trainer. Yeah, so it's a pro flight trainer. So you have a flight instructor. He's your trainer. He helps you with no. your diet and exercise. And he's got the Puma X, which is a tennis shoe you can do your workouts in. That's about, what you're going to show me. Forget about all that. Okay. <laughs> this is. Only to do with flight simulation, nothing to do with shoes. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, look, let's just bring it in. Just, okay. It's right there behind you. Just bring uh, it in. Oh, oh, this thing right here. Oh, yes. oh, 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 oh. You mean this Pro Flight Puma X? Yes. Oh, this is what you're talking about, the yes, Pro Flight is, Puma X. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get the camera so we can see what we're, what we're doing here. Okay, sounds good. So this is a Pro Flight Puma X. All right, now. Now, I've got some idea of what we're talking about. Or the Puma 10, we don't know. It's unknown. So All right, so this is a joystick. Helicopter controls. Helicopter, okay. All right, so let me take you through it just briefly. Okay. 1500 is what the base unit costs. Okay. This has the optional $99 tow brakes. Tow brakes. Is that what, yeah, that's what they call you can call helicopter them tow as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, then it also has the $99 optional dual throttle. So you have a throttle here. Oh, throttle look there. at that. I can twist each one individually. So okay. up to $1,700. Okay. Now it comes with a two year warranty, but if you want a five year warranty, that okay. adds another $100 to get okay. up to $1,800. Okay. And then it's $99 to ship to the United States. So now we're at $1,900. All in, yeah, with all the extras and the mm -hmm. shipping and the five-year warranty and all that. Okay. Like 1900 So 1500 base model up to 1900 delivered, big old warranty, uh, tow brake pedals, and dual throttle. That's right. Okay. Great. So, Shall we walk through each uh, axis on this thing? Sure. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quiz you on helicopters. Okay. So first of all, let's see. Is this showing up on camera? Yeah, I guess it is. What axis is this? What is this called, this axis? Well, I usually call it yaw, but you told me that it's anti-torque. That's correct. Anti-torque. And why is it called anti-torque on helicopters? Well, when you add a uh, pitch to the to the uh, propeller up the top. Rotor. The rotor. Sorry, the rotor. Yes. See, I'm not a helicopter That's guy. fine. A rotor. The rotor. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to want to spin the helicopter around and so in the same direction in, or the opposite direction the opposite of course and so you have to add some right typically correct uh, anti torque correct so and it's called anti torque because the rotor puts torque right that's if right. the rotor puts torque you need to not spin the helicopter in the opposite direction so what's going to stop torque anti torque, anti -torque. and also right. if you just wanted to rotate you know oh also if you axis, just want to aim yeah. the helicopter because you want to look at something right or point somewhere yes. and of course if the helicopter has wheels these w these tow brakes would i would thought helicopters had brakes. skids not all of them okay <laughs> exactly <laughs> except the ones with wheels right except the ones with wheels they have skids also if you were flying a a uh, plane with a stick in, in x plane right you would use these as tow brakes you can still the use plane. these tow brakes yes mm -hmm. So, okay. All right. Great. Now, this big black thing in your sure. face. Sure. What's this called? The cyclic. And why is it called the cyclic? Well, because of our earlier take, I happen uh -huh. to know yes. that um, when the rotor spins, it, it makes changes in a cycle because it goes all the way around. And one, that's one cycle, right? Correct. Okay. Now, from the last take that we just took that we <laughs> didn't upload to YouTube, uh, let's see if you still remember the answer. If, if this is the rotor, okay, my hand is the rotor up overhead and I pull back on the cyclic, what's the rotor gonna do? Well, before I said uh -huh. that the, the rotor would come up in the front, but uh -huh. you said it actually starts about 90 degrees Correct. ahead, so Correct. that when it gets to the front, it's up. It's all lifted up, right? Gyroscopic forces, they always apply 90 degrees around the direction of rotation. So whatever direction a disc is rotating, uh, go 90 degrees along the direction of rotation, that's where the force actually acts. That's why when you try and turn a gyroscope, it wants to like, go in a 90 degree opposite thing. So if you pull the stick back, that's gonna increase the pitch at this portion of the cycle, at this part of the cycle of the disc, that's gonna cause it to flap up. And if you look at it, you can see it's kinda, can you almost see like how the air moves over my hand, it's gonna get pulled up. So it helps to lift there. it up. Yeah. yeah, and then now you've got a lift vector 
that's pulling aft, and what's that going to do? Raise the nose. Yeah, it's, well, it's going to pull the nose back. It's going to pull the top back. It's pull the top of the helicopter back, or raise the nose. And then, coming down the other side, it, it goes down to negative pitch, and then it goes to flat pitch in the back. Yes, yeah, so you get a so, positive in the front and a negative in the back to give the Yes, total that's right. With the positive pitch in the front and a negative pitch on the left, the rotor flaps up in the front and flaps down in the back. That's going to tilt the lift vector aft, which is above the, the center of gravity of the helicopter, which will pull the nose back or up. So um, this is called a cyclic because it changes the rotor pitch in a cycle as it goes around. And then what's this called? That is the collective. And why is it called a collective? Because it changes the pitch collectively. Correct. The whole... uh, correct. The pitch changes no matter where it is in the rotor. And then what are these little motorcycle hand, throttle and handle so those type are things here? Throttles, which aren't as relevant these days because you typically have an auto throttle. But, correct. Uh, you can use them, I guess, to raise the throttle when you're sitting on the ground. And then the and why do you do that? In. Well, because if you pull the collective without any throttle, you're going to slow the rotor way down. All right, yes, that's all true, but here's what I'm trying to get at. When you start a helicopter, do you want to start it with the governor on? When you first start the engine, you're sitting on the ground and you're literally just hitting the start button. And do you want the governor already on? And before you answer your question, when you start your car, do you already have the gas pedal all the way down to your cruise position when you first turn the key or hit the start button? No. no. What would happen if you did? What if you happen if you had the gas pedal? What do you drive? The Dodge Demon Charger Hellcat well, Red Eye Devil uh, Machine? Don't have that anymore. But... Did you crash it? No, no. no. Okay, I'm a little I'm not surprised. You. You okay, yeah. this Ferrari. <laughs> okay, okay, yes. Yeah. So that was we'll a while about, ago. Yes, well, yeah, that was that was in a past life. But okay, so. Um, <laughs> But when you start, when you started your Hellcat Dodge Viper Demon thing, do you have the throttle about halfway down when you turn the key? Uh, no. No, because what would happen if you did? Oh, well, the RPM would yeah, shoot up. It'd be a, it'd it's just be not a, good for it because right. the engine's not good. It's not warmed up. It. It's not ready. So when you start it, you start it at idle. It's the same with the helicopter. When you start a helicopter, you want the throttles at idle so that as that engine spools up, it doesn't instantly go, you know, and, and just put massive torque. So you, first you start it with the throttles at idle, then you roll in the throttle gradually, okay? You gradually go, and you let the RPM come up. And once the RPM gets up to 75% or 80% or something like that, the governor kicks on, you see? And then the governor's gonna hold your RPM. Then you shouldn't have to touch the throttles again. So um, it's start at idle, bring in the throttle until you have enough RPM. The governor, an expert, I think the governor automatically engages. So uh, yeah, so these are the throttle axes. So okay, I think we've gone over everything. You've got your anti-torque to resist the torque of the overhead rotor. You got your uh, toe brakes um, in case you have a wheeled helicopter. You have your cyclic, which changes the, the overhead rotor pitch in the cycle, and explain simulates all of this course. And um, you've got your collective which uh, lifts the, the blade you know, collectively on the rotor, and then you can adjust the throttle as well. And then there's tons of buttons. There's and buttons everywhere. And then we have everywhere. a hat switch up here, so if you wanted to yep. look around, you could use the hat switch. Okay, look around, of course. And we don't use this to look around in the real helicopter, that's for dang sure. No. But, but that's uh, how maybe you would usually set it up in the, in, the, in the simulator to look around. Okay. Um, if you don't, especially if you don't have three screens. Okay. Um, and then you just, yeah, you have a bunch of buttons you can assign to whatever you want. Okay. Got it. Okay, buttons everywhere. So let's try. Oh, oh and how, how easy was this to assemble? Uh, well, I didn't do it. Neither did I. <laughs> we have people for that. <laughs> Someone did it, and he told us it took him an hour. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, I mean, that kind of sucks. It takes an hour to put together. But, but the advantage of that is it only costs $99 to have it shipped from Europe. And that's because they're able to, because it's a lot of parts, they're able to put it into a fairly small box, and it doesn't cost a fortune to have it shipped. And you get to know the thing pretty well when you assemble it. So if it ever breaks, you actually stand a chance of repairing it yourself if you break it. Yeah. And it's very repairable because you can see all the parts. Yeah, you can see the all open. the parts down here. It's like an Ariel Adam uh, sports car. You can just see all the little parts. But also, you know. If you had to replace something, you stand a decent chance of at least telling them what part to I mean, send you to replace. I mean, these are just nuts and washers. I mean, there's yeah. stuff you could even get at the hardware store, a lot of it. And you can adjust these things yourself with a wrench to adjust the resistance, right? Yeah, that's a positive and a negative. So if you want to adjust the resistance on this thing, you do need um, a little wrench thing like this. Yep. So you take it, you know, you put it on. You know, you can't see it's on the other side, but you put it on and you just turn it a little bit and it'll make it a little stiffer. You can loosen it completely up or it'll just flop over. It's mm -hmm. so loose. And then you can tighten it 
pretty much as tight as you and want. And does this self-center with springs? No springs, no. Correct. It, just, uh, it doesn't self-center. No detent. It, People yeah, hate detents. Yeah, no detent, no springs. It's just it goes wherever you put it, and you adjust the resistance with a wrench here on these little bolts. So um, and it's, it's high quality. It's metal. It's not super you know, heavy duty or strong, but it's strong enough to be a controller. And since things are made out of metal, not plastic, I mean, the quality seems very, very, very good to me. Very good. I mean, the $1,500 does not seem like a high price to me, because this is like, this now, is kind of high quality stuff. Now, most stuff I've seen, this is on the very low end of the scale as mm -hmm. far as price goes. But is it on the low end as far as quality goes? Now, I've used some $2,500 stuff before, and it was, you know, about on this level, it's uh -huh. kind of equal. Right, well, that's a pretty good deal. I would say so. Yeah. Okay, all right, so 1500 bucks, maybe 2000 I can't really find anything to complain about. I can always ask for things to be you know, heavier duty, so they don't flex or move at all when you're actually flying with them, but that's a pretty minor thing. You don't apply large forces when you're flying a helicopter any, anyway. Everything is small little motion. All right, why don't we plug this thing into X-Plane 12, and I've got two different flights that I want to do, and let's see how it handles. Good. Okay, so here we are sitting uh, in a little copy of X-Plane 12 beta here. It'll be coming out publicly really soon. Um, and we are going to give this Pro Flight Trainer Puma X a, uh, a flight. Now, Mike, I'm starting off for the very first time here. Do I want to fly a big, heavy, expensive helicopter or a small, light, cheap one for my first flight? Well, if you want to live, it's a big, heavy, expensive one. Exactly. And why is that? They got stability controls and everything happens at a slower rate. And right. Not exactly. Not twitchy. Exactly. Not twitchy. So we're going to start off in this big, heavy thing. Now, the first thing we're going to do is calibrate the joystick. So we go up to settings. And look, you see, we have the Puma. We have that imagery I was talking about. Uh, and um, so we have the image. We can see what's plugged in. And we can see what all the various axes are. I'm just going to hit calibrate, and my apology if this is boring, but let's just move the toe brake through their full range of motion, move the uh, yaw or any torque through its full range of motion. Oh, take the throttles, you know, all the way through their deal, and then uh, pitch and roll all the way through. Now, here's what's tricky about this. When I'm done with this calibration, I have to put everything exactly in the center and it doesn't center by itself. So I have to be very, very careful to, to center it all manually here. Okay, maybe that's centered. And now just don't touch it. Then I hit next, next. Okay, and just leave everything centered, don't touch it. So we've got our center. Okay, finish. All right, we seem to think we're done. So here we go. Now, we're clearly barely turning, right? We're at idle. The throttle is only 5% because we're at idle. So how am I going to get this thing enough RPM that I stand the chance of flying? Crank the throttle. Okay. Crank? I'm going to say ease in the throttle. So I'm going to ease in the throttle. And do you think you can read the data output there in this take? Do you think it's, it's legible on camera? No. No, not legible? Okay. So we're coming up to 40% throttle. Now, what's kind of interesting is... Once that throttle got to a certain point, it started changing by itself. And why did the throttle start changing by itself? The auto throttle. Right. So the auto throttle is now at 40%. And our propeller, what's our main rotor RPM right now? It's the first uh, one. 313. 300 RPM. 313 RPM. So as I raise the collective, what's going to happen? Well, the, the RPM is going to want to come down, but then the auto throttle is going to compensate to bring it back up. And as, as, as it brings it back up, what's going to happen to the overall torque on the helicopter? It's going to increase, which means you're going to have to do anti-torque with your feet. To counteract the torque. You got it. All right. Well, all that is true. Let's give it a try. Here we go. So I'm going to increase the collective. Bring in just... Oh, you hardly even need any anti-torque the way this thing is set up. Whoa. I'm guessing okay. it's controlled by a computer. I guess. Um, well, it might help a little bit. But uh, I don't think so, though. Not the anti-torque on this machine. But, um, but it sure is stable, though. Okay, so I had to get used to it just a little bit. I'm used to flying with the Logitech uh, Extreme 3D Pro, and that thing self-centers and has a very small uh, deflection. This does not self-center, so you really have to pay a lot of attention. Now, do you see the rotor disc up there? Mm -hmm. on the screen. Do you think that shows up on camera? Look in the viewfinder. Do, can can yes. our viewers see it? No, it, it can see it. Okay, good. Okay, so you can see 
what's happening to the rotor disc. All right, so we're going to start off in this in this big bad uh, Sikorsky S76 here. Okay, so my first thing that I notice is I feel like it's way too loose in roll. And what I mean by that is I have to move the stick a lot. In the real helicopter, you hardly move it at all. You hardly touch the stick in the real helicopter. I feel like I'm having to move the stick kind of a lot here to get any roll. So well, let's get a joystick calibration. Of course, you can adjust that in the uh, controller settings. Okay, so everything is now centered. And there's one other thing I want to show you. This is very, very important. And that is the uh, flight control sensitivity. What I really needed to do to make this thing feel right is adjust the curve to be like this, where it's much flatter in the center. And this actually, <laughs> to me, this graph is backwards from the way it should be. This is the way Tyler coded it. But um, this allows you to get uh, fine control right in the center. See, I, I flattened the curve out in the center, and I'm going to hit cancel just because I've already got it exactly the way I like it. But drag these curves to make them flat in the center. That's going to give you the, the uh, control you want. Okay, so let's hop back in. All right, so here we go. We're uh, in uh, Burlington, Vermont area. Oh, and let's roll in the throttle. Okay, I'm going to roll in the throttle. And as I roll in that throttle, the governor is going to engage. Okay, so Mike, uh, tell the customers what kind of throttle and prop or rotor RPM we have here in case they can't read it on screen. The rotor, we've got uh, 313. Yep, RPM. Mm -hmm. And the and throttles are at 40%. At 40%. Right. So, and so what's going to happen when I raise the collective? Well, the, the prop RPM is going to want to drop, so the throttle is going to come up to compensate. And then it's a, what's going to happen to the yaw of the helicopter when that torque comes up overhead? Well, it's going to want to rotate, so you have to put in some a little bit of anti -torque. opposite anti-torque okay. with the pedal. Yeah, there we go. A little so bit now the throttle's at 70-ish percent. Yeah, there we go. Oh, whoa, it's up to 80% because I kind of jerked it up. Okay, so here we go. Right, All 82, right. 83% yeah. throttle. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting. Do you see how small my motions are here on the cyclic? Mm -hmm. That is absolutely realistic. You should have extremely small motions on the cyclic. And we have these small motions because of the way we set that flat curve there in the middle. Um, all right, so now I'm going to bring the nose up here. Let's... Uh, all right, so I'm just going to fly this for a few minutes, and we'll go look at the trees and the beaches. Those are some new things we're uh, in the final stages of testing right now. Um, so let's just, I'll just go fly over here and we'll check them out. Okay, uh, so as I'm flying, you can see, and, and you see my cyclic stick moving on camera, don't you? Yes. It's like almost nothing. It's just the most subtle, teeny, tiny little bit of pressure. All right. So instead of flat trees, you now have 3D trees. Yeah, they're very three-dimensional. All right, let's And write. on the beaches, you actually don't have a straight line anymore. Yeah, not nearly and, as uh, straight anyway. The it's water, not as bad. The land goes below the water. Yep, and so with an amphibious uh, seaplane, you can actually roll into the water uh, from the land. And sure enough, the, it'll be a gradual transition as the weight is uh, borne by the floats instead of the wheels. Um, Let's go take a look at that if we can. All right. So, uh, yeah, it'd be nice. What would be cool is if we had a monitor set up down low so I could really see uh, below us. We just don't have that set up right now. All right, so I'm going to bring in a little more collective. All right, and so you can kind of see the uh, three-dimensional nature of the trees here. And then check out the beaches as well. Now, if we had a lot of wind set up, you'd see the trees blowing in the wind. I just don't quite have the guts to fly a helicopter in the wind right now uh, when I'm just getting used to this helicopter uh, flight control system. All right, so you see the beach. You see the way the beach kind of like fades into the water there a little bit. It's still kind of polygonal. We could always apply more polygons, but I'm not willing to apply enough polygons that uh, it takes forever to download, forever to load. Uh, forever to install or pff, a long time to update a frame. We're running at about 90 frames per second here, and uh, I, I aim to keep it that way. Frame rate is just so important. Um, okay, so I feel like we've got a fairly decent uh, idea of what it's like to fly with this hardware, and it's very, very good. Um, I think it's time we kicked up the challenge factor. You know what I'm going to do next, right? 
A small, twitchy, not as computerized helicopter. Yes, exactly. So let's go to flight configuration. We'll take the R22. I'm gonna bring in the throttle. We're gonna bring it up to RPM. The governor is engaged. Here we go. All right, we got the right time of day. We're not gonna do the flight model forces. I've brought the controls into the right position. At this point, I ought to be able to just fly the helicopter. All right, here we go. Still wandering back and forth a little bit here and heading. All right, over these 3D trees. All right, now what we're gonna try is a water landing, agreed? Sure. Okay, here we go. Let's, uh... all right. These floats are not good for much speed. Um, I'm gonna to want to land into the waves. So I'm looking at which way the waves are moving now. I'm gonna to wanna to land into them. Really just out of habit, I guess, as much as anything else. I'm pretty sure we're always supposed to land into the waves. Certainly we land into the wind with airplanes. I guess we'll land into the, the waves with a, a float helicopter. So uh, let's see, okay, here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. All right. I think we're doing okay here. Oh, it's kind of nice having the wraparound monitors here. Whoa. Okay, so I set the waves, oh lordy. Okay, so I set the waves to like two and a half feet high or something. Um, this is uh, <laughs> a little choppy out there. Yeah, I mean, look at this, look at this. Okay, now I'm gonna take the time to show flight model forces again. And you can see there's a lot going on here. You can see we've got the forces from the floats as well. So you can see the floats interacting with the water. The helicopter is moving underneath the rotor. The rotor is resisting motion as it's being tossed about by the helicopter and the whole thing's interacting with the waves. So this is a, uh, a very, very dynamic system. And if I was in the real helicopter now, I'd be more than a little scared. I was about to have to file uh, an insurance claim if I had insurance on this thing. And so you can really see um, the way we interact with the waves. And of course this applies to airplanes too, not just helicopters. Look at that. Yeah, I, and I set the waves to be absolutely as, as high as they could possibly be. Okay, let's turn off our forces. Okay, and now there's no way I'm gonna try and fly this thing from an external view. I just, it's too hard. So let's get back in here. Okay, and there's a little, little bit of a rendering bug there near the edge of the screen. We'll get that solved. There we go, there we go. Look at that. So you just add some collective and the next thing you know, you're out of the water. Look at that. And away you go. <sighs> okay, that was slightly nerve wracking. All right, so um, what else do we wanna go over? So it's, it's about an $1,800 piece of hardware. It, uh, it's high quality, high resolution, feels like a real helicopter and it's harder. Oh, one thing we were talking about in an earlier take that we did the other day, it's still harder to fly than a real helicopter. And why is that? Well, you don't feel it in your butt. That's right, you don't have your inner ear reacting to the rotation rates. You can't see what the helicopter is doing until you've actually gotten the effect on screen. So, um, yeah, it's not, you're using a different sense, you're using vision as opposed to inner ear. And the vision's always going to be just a little bit later. It takes you a second to process what you're seeing. And we're running at 70 FIPS, okay, 70 frames per second. That's a pretty nice frame rate, but it still takes just a moment for you to see what's happening. It takes you a moment to process and a moment to act on it. And, um, if, if you were, if you're actually moving, then your inner ear would pick up on these cues. And so uh, we don't have that. We don't have the inner ear. So, uh, you know, being actually uh, stimulated here in the simulator. So uh, this is a lot harder than flying a real helicopter. But the good news about that is, 
If you can fly this, you can fly a real one. Exactly. If you can get, if you can fly this without your inner ear, then when you get in the real helicopter, you are going to be absolutely set because um, the interface on this hardware is the same as the interface uh, in the real helicopter, and it really forces you to pay attention to what's going on because it's not exactly intuitive when you don't have your inner ear moving. And uh, if you can, yeah, if if you can fly this. You're ready to fly the real machine. So at any rate, yeah, this is the Pro Flight Trainer Puma X. Um, they sent it to us for review, and uh, I gotta say, I I like it. But when you're flying a lightweight helicopter like the R22, you still have to work for it if you want to keep this thing in one piece. You got to work for it because you don't have the inner ear, you don't have any computer making it stable for you.